Uh, I'm, I'm Robert Kersner. Uh, my day job is I'm uh, chair of dermatology at the University of Miami. Um, and also I'm uh, chair of, uh, co-chair of the SAWC, Symposium for Advanced Wound Care. And uh, this morning, we're going to be talking about navigating patient selection to optimize the clinical and economic effectiveness of skin substitutes. And um, let me just go through some of the, uh, uh, some of the, the paperwork here. So uh, next to me on my right, and uh, really the main course, I'll be the appetizer, is one of our uh, uh, esteemed uh, uh, clinical experts, Robert Clemency, who's, uh, he, he works in Munster, Indiana at the community health care system, and he has a wealth of experience in skin substitutes that he's going to share with you uh, as the second part of this presentation. Um, and uh, here are some of our disclosures uh, uh, listed here. Um, and uh, if we talk about anything off-label, investigational, we'll let you know. So what we hope to do is inve investigate the potential gaps and drawbacks of available efficacy data for skin substitutes, examine patient selection strategies to optimize effectiveness and outcomes of skin substitutes, and navigate clinical case outcomes for skin substitutes, leveraging appropriate patient selection. And we'll hopefully accomplish that over the next hour or so. Uh, I'm going to kick it off by talking about efficacy, effectiveness, and patient selection in the use of uh, skin substitutes. So, so let's get started, and of course, uh, we hope to have some time during, uh, at the end for, uh, for Q&A. So, um, and of course, the focus, at least, of, of my presentation, uh, by and large, is going to be uh, diabetic foot ulcers. And uh, when um, I published a few articles in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, oh, the first one was uh, nearly 20 years ago, and the last one was about four or five years ago, uh, each of those had an algorithm that probably, in some way, shape, or form, all of you follow where your patient comes in with a foot ulcer, you want to assess their vascular status, you want to look signs of infection, you'll perform debridement, you, you'll offload, and then if they're not doing uh, better at some point, you'll go on to advanced therapy. And, and, um, and, uh, and, and that's kind of the, the standard of care. Um, and the question is, is, you know, what happens in real life? And I've been interested in the idea of uh, of what happens in real life for a while now. This is a paper we, I wrote 20 years ago uh, looking at clinical and economic outcomes for graft skin, which was the, one of the original names of Aplograph. Um, and, uh, and this is a more recent uh, uh, paper uh, just a, year, uh, a couple years ago um, where we looked at uh, evidence and cost effectiveness. So I've been interested in this topic of uh, kind of real world data and effectiveness uh, for some time. So I'm happy to share with you. Uh, some of my thoughts and some information about that. Now, many of you have seen this evidence pyramid, um, and, and you've probably seen it a lot, and people, you know, talk about it. And it's, it's very valuable because at the very bottom, there's a lot of information about ideas and maybe even in vitro or animal studies, and then things eventually get taken to patients. You have case series uh, and reports, case-controlled studies, cohort studies. And then finally, you get to randomize control trials. And then actually at the very top is an evaluation of multiple randomized, uh, randomized controls trials or systematic reviews and meta-analysis if you, if you do statistical analysis on all the data. Um, and these are very, very valuable in determining, you know, can a product work, okay? What's not on this pyramid and which I'm going to d dive into is real world evidence. What happens when you go from this hierarchical pyramid where randomized control trials is really at the pinnacle, or at least at multiple randomized control trials, and what really happens once those products if, uh, go into the real world and, and used as we all might use them? Um, so, this is kind of the idea is that efficacy is defined as the results of a randomized controlled trial. And it really says under ideal situations, can a product work? But on the other side of that is effectiveness. And that means once it gets out there in our hands, does it work? Okay, and this is really clinical practice data. Um, and we're gonna explore the differences in the next few slides about these two types of data. So I think you all know 
a little bit about randomized control trials. So usually patients are randomized to receive a no treatment or standard of care or a placebo. And then this is an experiment, a human experiment where in general well done randomized control trials um, have one variable difference. Patients are randomly assigned to one group or another. Uh, the investigators are masked or blinded. Sometimes it's single blinded, sometimes it's double, sometimes it's even triple when, when the uh, statistician's also blinded. And, um, and the results you get out of that are the results of a well done experiment. The better the experiment, the more reliable the results are, the more believable, the more you can count on them. On the other hand, real world evidence is clinical evidence about the, the potential use in, in real practice. So real world evidence can take lots of different ways. It can be, it can be retrospective or prospective, meaning somebody could look at the data sets and look back and see what was happening. Or it could be designed prospectively, and what's that's called the pragmatic or simple trial, where things happen as they would normally happen in practice. Um, and so, uh, and then you can get data that is very generalizable to what you and I do in our daily practice. If you put those kind of things into a chart, this is what you, you, you do. There, there, there are different types of evidence, efficacy versus effectiveness, experiment versus real world setting, things that are well designed versus things that happen in real life practice. The eligibility in a randomized control is very strict. You can't have patients with liver disease or renal disease or an albumin, but in real life, you can put, you could treat these patients in any way, shape, or form you like until you can get data looking at that. You may follow them in a trial every week, but in real life you may see them in three days and then three weeks later. So it's a variable pattern of follow-up. Um, and of course when you're doing uh, efficacy or randomized control trial, the treating person is the investigator. In real life it's the treating pr pr uh, practitioner. And then you can also look at different comparators in real world evidence. In a randomized controlled trial, in advance, you decide what your comparator is going to be. But if you go back into a chart review, you can say, or retrospective analysis, you can say, well, I want to compare it to this or that or this. And you can do many comparisons. Um, and uh, so, so there are differences. There are advantages and limitations of both. Neither one is perfect. Neither one is the, the, the panacea, but together they give a wealth of data about both efficacy and effectiveness. So a randomized controlled trial um, is great because you randomize things between the two groups. So you hope that the two groups are very similar. It's easier to mask or blind observations. You can analyze them very easily with well-known statistical um, tools and because you have very strict inclusion and exclusion criteria those that are participating are clearly identified you know the populations that's being studied unfortunately this is very expensive you know if you did a major uh, clinical trial in wound healing you're talking about 15 20 25 million dollars to answer a, a, a single question. Patients that enter the studies volunteer, and you always worry that the people that enter the study are going to be different than the real world. There may be a bias just by people who agree to be in the study. Um, and then there may be loss to follow up that, you, uh, that may be attributed to the treatment, but it may not be due to the treatment. On the other hand, the advantages of real world evidence is the less time and cost uh, when compared to an RCT that uh, research uh, can be done uh, when RCTs uh, is possible. It's a, um, excuse me, research cannot be done when, with, uh, with, with RCT is possible. That is, some people may feel uncomfortable initially studying high risk populations. Um, but then later on you can look at real world evidence and get information about those higher risk uh, populations. It's a lot faster if you do a retrospective analysis of a data set. Uh, you can look at all that data relatively quickly in, uh, uh, as opposed to having to prospective randomized trial for 12, 16, 20, 24 weeks and then follow up. 
And then you can model this in, with different statistical tools to make some conclusions. On the other hand, the sample size generally has to be pretty, uh, pretty uh, large. It's, not, it's cheaper, but not necessarily cheap, and it's shorter time, but it's not necessarily no time. Um, you have to have a certain degree of expertise to do this type of analysis. Um, and of course, you want to, because you're looking at back into data sets, there's always the possibility of bias as you analyze uh, the data. So there, there are both advantages and disadvantages of these, um, uh, of these, of these techniques. Now, this is a, 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 from the American Diabetes Association. This is from 2018. This is a, a, a monograph that was produced by the American Diabetes Association. I was one of the authors uh, in this. And in this, we had a, 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 a table about evidence-based advanced therapies for diabetic foot ulcers. Um, so this is one indication, diabetic foot ulcers. There are greater than 80 plus products at that time in uh, for diabetic foot ulcers available adv advanced pr uh, products. But of those 80, there was about a dozen that had any type of real evidence other than clinical series, okay? So you went from 80 to whatever the number here is, about a dozen. Um, and we looked at uh, the percent that was healed in randomized control trials, the time to closure, whether or not the product was FDA approved versus cleared, how good the study was, was there just one randomized control trial or another, and whether or not at that time there was effectiveness data. And we looked at growth factors, recombinant and uh, platelet release aid. We looked at cellular constructs, bilayered and dermal constructs. We looked at acellular constructs. We looked at placental membranes, and then we looked at other things like negative pressure and hyperbaric oxygen. And if you, what you can see is that um, uh, there, of those what is two, four, six, eight, eleven uh, products that have any evidence? Four were approved by the uh, by the FDA. All the others were um, were uh, cleared. And in general, when a product had to go through FDA approval, the study quality was higher. And the products that were around a little bit longer often had more RCTs and also had effectiveness data, real-world data. So this was a nice table to kind of put into context um, the products you can use. So as you, as you go about your business, are you using something that has pro, uh, uh, data of any sort or, or, or are you not? Now that's kind of complicated. I want to make it simple just to show you what quality means. And I'm going to use a simple idea, the idea of sample size, all right? And this is something for offloading. And we're going to look at total contact cast and instant total contact cast. If you look at uh, for total instant total contact cast and for total contact cast, when the sample size was small, less than 20 patients, you had spectacular healing, 94 and 85 percent healing. But as the sample size using those same technologies is a little bit bigger, now about 80 patients, you could see how the healing rate came down. What, what the idea is that as you get a larger sample size, a, a.k.a. a higher quality study where you're getting a, a larger group, you begin to get closer to the truth. And this is just an example of how quality in studies are going to be, uh, in, in efficacy studies, are going to be very important. Okay. Now, diabetic foot ulcers are a very important disease state, right? We know that 85% of leg amputations are preceded by diabetic foot ulcers. One in every six or seven diabetic foot ulcers eventually ends in an amputation, and every five minutes an amputation occurs. And we know that amputation is not even the worst thing that can happen to these patients, as their five-year mortality is somewhere between 30 and 50%. Um, more than prostate or breast cancer. So we know that this is an important disease. So I think it's important that we approach the patients in a logical way and use different products that in different ways with evidence that can, can, can that hopefully will change the fate of these patients. Now I just want to use an example of one of the products that has the, the best data, just to give you an example of what high quality data might look like. And this is the bilayered living cellular construct. It has a fibroblast in a bovine type 1 collagen matrix over top 
it's layer, uh, you have keratinocytes and it's grown in a lab and uh, this is the product known as, as aplograph, but this is, and you can see histologically in its cartoon, it looks very much like human skin. It doesn't have blood vessels, doesn't have melanocytes or Langerhans cells, but the similarities far away the differences in its, in its physical structure. It started with having a randomized control trial. This is a, a trial for diabetic foot ulcers. It also got, uh, there was also a trial for venous leg ulcers that led to FDA approval a study of a little over 200 patients where they, dem uh, and these were, you know, well done study, match populations of, of kind of larger size diabetic foot ulcers and uh, of relatively long duration. And the primary endpoint was complete healing at 12 weeks and both to complete healing at 12 weeks and time to closure favored this. This is an old study. It's been around for, um, uh, for 20, 20 years. In addition, there was, it was found that if you receive the, uh, the product, you are less likely to have osteomyelitis and less likely to have amputation. So these are dramatic outcomes. So that's clinical trial efficacy data. But what happened in the real world? Now when you look in the real world, you can look at effectiveness, that's real world data, but you can also look at comparative effectiveness, meaning you could choose to compare it to another product. Okay, and this was a product that was, uh, 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 has been in use for a while, the uh, dehydrated uh, amnion and chorionic membrane uh, that's uh, uh, used, because usually when you go to see a, a patient goes to see a doctor, the doctor doesn't say, listen, your, your wound is not getting better and we have two options. One option is to give you a treatment, the other is to give you a placebo, or, right? That's not what, you, usually you say we have two options, option A or option B. So that's where comparative effectiveness may be of benefit. And as you can see here, the bilayered living construct uh, had greater frequency of wound closure at 12 and 24 weeks and had a faster mean time of closure. All what I'm saying with these two parts of data is that this product has both efficacy and effectiveness data, both for venous leg ulcers and diabetic foot ulcers. So it gives a lot of confidence that not only can it work, but it does work in practitioners' hands. In addition, there's mechanistic uh, how it works, which uh, most products don't have. Uh, this was a study that was carried out at the University of Miami, where patients either got the, the bilayered le living cellular construct or standard of care, and biopsies were done at baseline and a week later after the product was applied. Um, and what was uh, and what was found, just to summarize a whole lot of scientific data, was that bef before the treatment, these were chronic wounds, okay? But after the treatment, a week later, the wound changed. It changed because the inflammation changed from chronic non-healing inflammation to acute inflammation that allowed it to go on to, to heal. The keratinocytes at the edge went from hyperproliferative and non-migratory to a migratory phenotype. Um, there, was the there was less fibrosis in the wound bed and there was greater cell signaling. So this is a product that has efficacy, effectiveness, and mechanism of action data to help us understand how to uh, product, uh, how to, uh, about this product. Now I want to move on and begin to talk about, okay, so there's efficacy data and effectiveness data. Some, some products even have a, a, a mechanism of action, but how should we think about them? Well, so when we think about the products, we're also thinking about the timing of the products and why are you using the products. Sometimes you're using a product just to control an environment, to keep it in a situation where it's not, gonna, it's not getting worse. Sometimes you're using products to support the healing environment, and sometimes you're, you're moving on to products uh, to bring a product to complete closure and healing. And if you'd layer on this idea of applying standard of care in the beginning, as you're in a control situation, but then in some patients, you're, you, the, the patients are improving, in those situations you might look to control, heal, control or support healing. But in other situations where a patient's not improving, then you might want to use something to, to, go, uh, to bring healing uh, about. So this is kind of the concept, and Dr. Clemency will go on in great, greater detail in a moment to discuss this. 
So I want to share with you some real-world data about uh, a couple products that you probably use. One is, is this uh, purified native type 1 collagen matrix plus polyhexamethylene by guanide, the PHMB, antimicrobial, um, also known uh, as Puriply. And this is an analysis we just, uh, uh, we had performed over the last number of months. There's a poster uh, um, uh, at this meeting and a manuscripts in, 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 uh, in publication or in, in process of being submitted for publication. The first you want, you want to see is that we looked at a, 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 a large data set, okay? And this data set had millions of patients, okay? You can see, I think it says 22,873,000, et cetera. And then we looked at the group that got this uh, polyhexamethylene biguanide uh, product and the group that didn't. The group that didn't could have gotten other, other things other than skin substitutes. They could have got hyperbaric oxygen and negative pressure, but they didn't get a skin substitute and they didn't get polyhexylmethylene by guanide. And then we looked at uh, uh, certain criteria, they, when they were diagnosed and then how long they were followed. Um, and, uh, and we ended up having 12,000 in one group and 578,000 in the other to compare. Now, Hopefully you can see this, but if not, I'll walk you through it. And there are two uh, kind of parts of this slide. The first half on your left is what's called pre-match. And this is what the patients look like, those 12,000 versus 578,000. And the first thing that you see is that the patients who got the polyhexylamethylene biguanide product were much sicker than the other group more diabetic complications, more peripheral vascular disease, more cerebral vascular disease, congestive heart failure, renal, myocardial in infarction. They had ulcers twice as long. They had more, more, more inf infections. Uh, and this was before they got the product, okay? This is a product that is designed to support, control or support healing. Yet it was reserved or being used in real life for the most difficult patients. This is not where this product wasn't being tended to use. It was intended to be used very early in the disease course, and yet in real life it was being used very later. Now to compare what happened with patients, we had to match the patients. So we took that 12,000 patients who got this uh, PCMB, and then we matched them to a si patients who didn't get it, who had a similar characteristics. And we tried to uh, match them with something called propensity analysis. And then we were able to compare the two groups because now they're much similar. And what was found, interestingly, when you looked at the post-match group, the two groups that were similar, the patients who got the PCM, uh, MP, uh, PCMP were statistically and, uh, and clinically significantly less lower, likely to have a lower uh, uh, amputation, and, and both above knee, below knee, or foot and ankle amputations were less frequent, okay? This was a data set, an administrative data set, so we were not able to look at healing, because in administrative data sets, you don't check a box and say a patient's healed or not, but you check a box whether they now have an, you know, they went through an amputation, had an amputation procedure. So this is dr dramatic, two findings. The first finding is that uh, patients were getting this product much later than they were intended to get it, but once you, had, once you matched the two groups, the product actually did quite well. Now, if you thought that was unique for the, that product, here's another product, uh, a, a dehydrated amnion chorion membrane. Similar situation. This is a product that perhaps is now to support healing or maybe to bring a patient to healing. But still, in most algorithms, like the one I showed you, you're supposed to use the product after four weeks if a patient's not getting better. Once again, these patients had ulcers for seven months, you know, 28 weeks, you know, compared to what is recommended with, uh, with guidelines to be treated after four weeks. So once again, these products are being much later used than they're supposed to be uh, used. And if you look at the outcomes, you see positive outcomes. So, so in the last few minutes, I'm just going to say, well, why is this? Well, the first thing that I want to share with you is that most of you and I 
probably think that when a small wound comes into your uh, uh, office and it's of short duration, you say, this is going to be a tee shot. This is going to be really easy. I'm going to heal this just like that. I don't need to do anything special. Well, it turns out while small ulcers of short duration are easier to heal than larger ulcers of longer duration, the truth is we still heal less than 40% of them. So while they're easier, they're not, they're not easy wounds to heal. They're still very, very challenging. And I think oftentimes we're fooling ourselves when we think, oh, this is going to be real easy. It's a small ulcer. And the data bears that out. Um, we also looked at some, uh, some of this data a number of years ago where we compared uh, a bilayered uh, skin equivalent with uh, different growth factors. And I just want to go through that data relatively uh, quickly. In this case, we used the, the, uh, the, the net health data set and we were able to look at healing, so the endpoint in this study was healing. But what we found, there was uh, some products were used on smaller wounds, but interestingly, some uh, products were used on deeper wounds, but interestingly, some products weren't used as early as they should have been used. Remember, we, the, the guidelines suggest that you should use a product if a wound isn't healing after four weeks. And what we found was the, the uh, bilayer living cellular construct did better than the platelet release set, did better than topical growth factors. But importantly, for all of the products, all of them did better if you used them earlier. And that's one of the major take-home messages, that earlier use of these products results in better outcomes. So I'm going to stop here and just some, conclude uh, what, I, what I did and then hand the, the podium over to uh, Dr. Clemency. While randomized controlled trials don't replicate real-world experience, certainly well-done, larger, and more rigorous randomized contr uh, controlled trials can better begin to predict what happens in real-world pr practice. There's more generalizability if you have a high-quality trial. But importantly, both well-performed randomized controlled trials and real-world data can help you uh, uh, make clinical decisions. And then finally, Understanding when a product should be used and using it appropriately is, and, and especially when you're taking care of patients uh, with really challenging wounds with potentially bad outcomes like diabetic foot ulcers, using them at the optimal time and the optimal product, and we're going to hear more about that in a second, is going to be critical to optimizing your outcome. So I'm going to stop here and, hand, and we'll take questions at the hand. I'll hand the podium over to Dr. Clemency. Thank you for your attention. So uh, it's nice to be here from Indiana. Uh, thank Dr. Kersner and SAWC and Organogenesis for having me. What I'm going to do in the second part of this talk is, is present you really difficult clinical cases. Um, all of these are surgical cases. Um, with, with some combination or use of um, advanced skin substitutes um, at any phase of, of their treatment. Um, once, they, once I started or initiated care, all the way to closure. All these cases demonstrate good outcomes, um, and certainly we know from day-to-day -day practice that, that that's not always the case. Um, and as to Dr. Kersner's point, some of these really small wounds that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis can be some of the most challenging to get closed. So with that, uh, Every day we see wounds that come through our office or our clinic, um, and, and whether these are acute or chronic or traumatic, um, all of these wounds want to heal. Um, and so it's our job to support and optimize that wound through really good management of the patient. Um, and then these skin substitutes are simply a tool in our toolbox. So whether it's to save time or, or to save a limb, um, certainly over decades we've demonstrated the efficacy and, and, and more, excuse me, and more recently the effectiveness of these products. Um, so again, the most important thing, and I think Dr. Kirshner touched on this, is um, really good medical and surgical management of these patients. They're all very complicated medically. Um, and you can throw product after product at these patients, but if you're not practicing good medicine and optimizing these patients, they're not going to work. Um, so in my world, uh, lower extremity surgery, um, we get these patients in the office and first and foremost we're trying to understand um, their overall health state. A lot of them come with uh, significant comorbidities 
And so we're, we're using multidisciplinary management to try and optimize their health. Um, as, as we get closer to where the wound's located, we're certainly assessing the blood flow. We want to understand arterial blood flow, venous blood flow. Um, and then now we're, we're getting down to the wound, right? So we need to understand more about what's going on in the wound. Is it chronic? Is it acute? Um, are there critically exposed support structures? Is there a bone infection? Um, is there undermining? So the characteristics of that wound, how long that wound's been present is critical in, in, in formulating a treatment plan. And then certainly, if, if advanced therapies are gonna be used or skin substitutes, which, which therapy's appropriate? Um, and, and something I think that's over-missed in a lot of these, these patients, or certainly in our clinic, is considering the socioeconomic factors of these patients, where they come from, what their, 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 their social settings like, their work life is like. Um, part of being successful in this business is, is getting good buy-in from the patients, having them follow up. I tell them every day, I, I will do my best for you. We will, we will practice really good medicine and surgery for you, but I need you to follow up go to your appointments, go to the infusion clinic, see your doctors, get the tests completed. And if none of that gets done, um, we're, we're not gonna have a good outcome. And, and next is, let's implement local wound care. To, to circle back just on the, the, the non-compliance piece of this, um, it cannot and should not be overlooked that patients um, have preconceived notions about care and who's delivering care and they certainly um, have their own socioeconomic circumstances that affect their ability to receive care. So I think that's something that we should really consider. And one study was done that demonstrated 55% of VLU patients um, needed some sort of assistance. And they all expressed concern about, you know, who's changing my dressings or home health care versus seeing a physician versus seeing an advanced practice nurse or a nurse nervous to have dressing changes. And we know in these patients specifically, there can be a lot of drainage, and so these the frequent dressing changes are, are important. So how can we use advanced skin substitutes to manage drainage? Um, maybe we don't have to change the dressings as much. And, and things like this, more chronic wound cases will be more addressed in the, in the lunch hour at, at Innovation Theater. Again, all my cases are uh, really started in the surgical setting uh, for this morning. Um, so Again, standard wound care, I think we all know how to do it. Um, has to be done really, really well. Um, you, once you get down to the foot, debridement, critical. Um, all non viable tissue slough has to be removed. Um, you have to optimize that wound environment. Um, and in doing so, I think you'll control infection, you'll control inflammation. Again, this will assist in controlling moisture, and then compression when appropriate, and certainly offloading when appropriate. But these are all things that go that play into a much larger picture in terms of the overall health of the patient and not just necessarily specific to the, to the wound or the type of wound we're treating um, in the clinic. So I've brought with me five of my own cases to share with you today. Um, a lot of them are staged um, limb salvage cases from our center. Um, so we both have the, the inpatient care setting, surgery, and then outpatient clinic. So this, is, this first case was a diabetic foot infection. It was a gas, gain, a gas forming um, infection in a 69 year old male patient. Um, typical comorbidities, he's diabetic, coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease, um, hypertension and sleep apnea. I was called to the emergency room. Um, the patient was septic. Uh, we went right to the operating room that night. Uh, he had a guillotine uh, transmetatarsal amputation. Um, and this is him one week after he was out of the ICU and stabilized, certainly receiving uh, local wound care while hospitalized with physical therapy for continued dressing changes and, and, um, ulcer and, um, and ultrasonic debridement, as well as um, just kind of letting things drain out and get healthy and let the patient stabilize. Once the patient was stabilized, um, and this was approximately two weeks later, we were able then to um, have interventional cardiology get involved. Um, and he did undergo angioplasty um, and arthrectomy of the anterior tibial artery as well as the dorsalis pedis, but unfortunately they were not able to successfully revascularize his PT. And we all know that it, when, it, when we talk about the foot and, and the pedal loop, how important um, the, the post-tib artery is, um, certainly you can get um, uh, a collateralization and, and um, but when I see something like this, I, I, and, I, and I spoke to the patient, I, these outcomes 
for him don't look good at this point. Um, but again, two weeks later, the quality of this wound already looks much improved, right? So infectious disease is seen and evaluated the patient, a PICC line was started, a wound vac was started approximately that time after he was revascularized and these pictures take you through those initial outpatient visits after he was discharged from the hospital but placed in a nursing home for continued care as he was non-weight bearing. Um, so we can start to see some healing, which is really encouraging and that's what I told him. Um, the blood flow looks good. Week seven, we went back to the operating room. Um, all of the exposed bone was resected and a collagen bilayer matrix was applied for coverage of critical structures. Um, wound vac therapy is initiated immediately following application of this skin substitute. And week eight and nine, you can start to see that we're getting nice uptake. We continue that wound vac. He's continuing his intravenous antibiotics. He's maintained a non-weight bearing status. He's at a nursing home and being transferred um, to, our, to our center for weekly evaluations. Things that I'm looking at when, I'm, when I use this specific product is um, the peri wound, the wound itself, are we getting fluid underneath, um, infection, hematoma, et cetera. So we do see these patients weekly still, even though they're not gonna undergo debridements, we wanna be constantly checking the quality of that wound. At week 10, that silicone layer was removed, and you can see he has a really nice, healthy, granular wound bed. Um, no critical structures exposed, no bone exposed. And this is a time where you start to consider what my options are. Go back, skin graft, or are we going to continue advanced therapies in the outpatient setting where we're applying skin substitutes? And in this patient's case, um, he, he's on multiple blood thinners. Um, he, he had significant disease in the contralateral leg. Um, he wasn't a great candidate to go back to surgery. No one was enthusiastic about doing it. We had a nice thing going, meaning we had transportation in place. He was comfortable with the, the parameters that we had set out for him in the beginning in terms of our goals. Um, and so at that time, we made the decision to um, move forward with continued um, weekly visits in the outpatient wound care center, good debridements, offloading, wound vac therapy coupled with an antimicrobial um, dressing. Um, and, that, and that was applied on a, on a weekly basis. Um, and so you can start to see the quality of this wound are changing, it's starting to granulate in. You're, start, yeah, you're starting to see a uh, decrease in size, um, significant decrease in size. And one thing that Dr. Kirzner talked about and, and, and we think about when we're talking about algorithms about do we stick with a certain product or do we switch or what's going on? Um, I think the biggest thing I'm looking at is the, the size of that wound. Did, have we seen a significant decrease? And are the qualities of that wound still really good? And in this case, they were. And so I wasn't concerned about needing to switch. I, I continued on um, with weekly, weekly debridements and applications, continued offloading. And um, you can see by week 23 that there's not much left. And, um, at about week 25, we had this patient closed. So there's a nice outcome. Um, the next case is a traumatic wound in a 76-year-old female. The reason I brought this case today is not necessarily, um, the, the wound's not overly impressive, but um, the, the, the factors surrounding this patient's care. She had this traumatic wound to the leg. She was gardening and, and I think a, a rake or something um, went through her lower leg and, and it was quite deep and she was evaluated in the emergency department she she did have active bleeding at the time and she was referred up to our advanced our APNs in, in the outpatient setting and they initially attempted lower uh, or they attempted wound care but she just kept bleeding and she she's quite a bleeder um, she does have AFib she was on um, uh, blood thinners uh, and, and does have venous disease as well um, but what we came to find out is that she had active bleeding within the posterior compartment due to uh, a laceration of one of her, her perforating veins. Um, and so for two days, this patient um, was bleeding. And so when I got a hold of her, um, we had to go right to the operating room and, and stop the bleeding. And I, th I think the point is, in this case, and then when you think about wound care more broadly, is a, a wound is not always what it seems. And, 
Dr. Kersner is a dermatologist can certainly tell you that there, a lot of times it's cancer or some of these really small wounds can be pretty complicated to, to heal. So I think you always have to have your antennas up when you're, when you're taking care of these patients. So when I took her to the operating room, we were able to stop all the bleeding and, and this would then um, enable us to continue with, with wound care on the outpatient or the, the outpatient side. Um, during that initial um, uh, surgical procedure, I, I applied an antimicrobial um, to the wound bed, an antimicrobial dressing. Um, and, and that picture in day 14 is her first follow-up visit after surgery, okay? Day 20, we can see significant improvement. And unfortunately, I had no pictures of the depth of the wound. There was, um, there was Surgicel um, that was placed, and so I don't have pictures, but it was quite deep. So we used a combination of an antimicrobial dressing with um, negative pressure therapy and compression. We, we assessed her, her arterial blood flow, which was deemed to be sufficient for compression. Um, and again, she does have a history of venous disease, so compression would be critical. And, this patient in particularly, I had a difficult time convincing her to keep wearing it. Um, it was a, it was a really a, a real struggle, um, but we 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 trudged forward, and um, by day 28, you can start to see that uh, there is no depth, no critically exposed support structures, um, and and the qualities of, of that wound uh, are much improved. Um, and by day 41, um, you can already start to see that it's it's trying to epithelialize. And, and by day 58, we're closed. And so I thought this was a nice outcome um, for, for this patient. Um, and, and again, none of our patients want to go to the operating room. And so I think what I try and do is um, use surgery as a last resort. Um, you never want to burn bridges, uh, but I also don't negotiate. So if I think that it's going to be beneficial to take the patient and there's no alternatives, then, then we go to surgery. Um, and I, so I think part of that is building that relationship with the patient, understanding all of the, the, the health issues with that patient, and considering uh, the patient's um, ability to comply with, with treatment. Um, this third case was an infected Achilles tendon. I was called uh, as a consult in the hospital. She's a 77-year-old uh, female patient um, who failed outpatient, outpatient management of chronic wounds. She's got diabetes, um, but really bad necrobiosis lipotica, and, chronic wounds, both lower legs, arms, knees, you name it, I mean, it's everywhere. And it's, uh, she's a, a fabulous human, um, really bad disease. Um, and so we, she's still one of my patients today and uh, we struggle to, to keep her closed through local management at, at my community hospital and then, and then over at the University of Chicago. So she presented with this wound on the, on the right side. Um, an MRI was obtained at her time of admission, demonstrated a fluid collection in the posterior compartment of the lower leg um, with some tenosynovitis of the Achilles. This patient was taken to surgery. There was concern for abscess and consultation with infectious disease. They felt um, uh, cleaning it all up, removing uh, all the, the, the skin or, or the undermining would, would, would be uh, the best option for this patient. Um, day seven represents the, the, the first post-operative picture uh, while she was hospitalized. Um, we were able to get her discharged from the hospital on oral antibiotics. Um, we discontinued her steroid use at the time um, and then back to, back to the office um, in day 12, our center. Uh, at day 12, it was very sloughy. Uh, and, and so I made the decision due to what, how much tendon was exposed, her disease state. Um, my concern about her age, um, that I would go back to surgery, I would debride this tendon, um, circumferentially prepare the wound, and then apply a bilayer matrix um, with the goal of granulating over the tendon. Day 18 was her first post-operative visit. I see all of these patients after um, surgical application of skin substitutes in my office within a day or two. Actually, most, most all wound care patients, if they've been to surgery, will see me in the office within 24 to 48 hours. But again, ensuring no seroma, hematoma, infection, good adherence. Sometimes it's to even put the wound back on. Um, so she, that, that's her picture, day 18. And then day 39, uh, you can see nice coverage, uh, no, no tendon really exposed. Um, and I felt at this time, uh, given the size, um, that we would go back to surgery for, for split, thickness, split thickness skin grafting. Um, and day 68, I would, I would call this healed. 
Day 88, she was back in the office for another wound on the contralateral leg, so we, we were able to take a look at her, her, her leg um, that we, we grafted. And then um, much later down the road, as I, as I said, she, she's, a, she's a frequent flyer here in our clinic. And uh, you can see that it, it looks quite well, and, and um, the this, this skin's taken well, and she has full function of her lower leg. Um, this was a really, really good case, too. Um, this was a 53-year-old male, uh, really sick guy, uh, diabetes, hypertension, really, really bad vascular disease. If you can see in day zero, his left leg had just been amputated, and this, this guy sticks in my mind. He, he come in with his seven-year-old son or eight-year-old son, and so, you know, you start to think about what this gentleman's life would be like missing both legs, um, what that does to his physiology in terms of the stress on his heart and his kidneys. Um, so not that I don't work hard for all my patients, but this one particularly stood out in my mind. Um, so the history for him is he had numerous uh, peripheral vascular interventions, surgical interventions for critical limb ischemia. Um, unfortunately, he had a fempop bypass on the left side that didn't go well and ultimately ended up with a BKA. Um, and in his post-operative course developed CLI of the right leg. So um, I was called, um, this, is, this was him in the hospital. Um, so at the time the patient then uh, required catheter-assisted acoustic pulse thrombolysis, so an arthrectomy of the right lower leg coupled with stage surgical intervention of his, of his, of his limb. Um, I think the one thing that when you look at a foot like this and, and you start to consider the ramifications of being a double amputee um, in, in really all of our patients that may face amputation is, you know, I think sometimes we can get caught up in heal the wound at all cost. And it's not necessarily the case. I think you have to um, be really judicious about the resources you're using, um, be realistic about uh, potential outcomes for that patient and what their life looks like. And again, that's kind of the art of this is trying to mere expectations of the patient, yourself, what's feasible, um, and, and what their quality of life can be. So it's not just necessarily heal the wound, but I like to talk about restoring function. And a lot of times you can restore function with amputation. So um, I think that's important to, to, to remember. This patient was, was very complicated medically, and, and, and clearly he was, um, in, in the hospital setting, was, was optimized as best we could. We had vascular surgery, uh, cardiology, infectious disease, physical therapy. Uh, we, we really um, had a team of people working on him. Um, after I initially saw his foot and he, he underwent uh, revascularization or at least optimization of the right lower leg, he was taken to surgery for uh, amputation of the forefoot with uh, resection of all the necrotic tissue in the, in the dorsal compartment of his foot. Um, so sharp debridement in the operating on the dorsal compartment of the foot, so removal of all non-viable tissue, uh, then the use of a hydrosurgical knife for tissue sparing purposes, uh, and then application of a, of a, of a bilayer matrix uh, to, to, the, um, to cover the critical structures within the dorsal compartment of the foot. And this is day 12, um, and I think he was still in the hospital at this time. Actually, he may have just gotten out, and this may be in the clinic. So day 28, uh, we had nice uptake with, with the collagen matrix. Um, the silicone layer was removed. Um, and we took him to surgery. And I believe the picture on the left in, in, in the, the, the center picture of him in the operating room, I, I staged this or set him up with the use of an antimicrobial dressing um, to, to help optimize the wound bed for, for take when I, when I skin grafted him. So, that's day 28, skin grafted, um, day 36, and we had him closed. So, and he is, he's since been out of my office, he still sees primary care, and uh, he still has his leg. So it's, a, it's, it's been a nice win. As you know, some of these, these cases with severe vascular disease with intervention, th those can shut down pretty quickly. So uh, this is uh, my last case uh, for the morning. This was a 66-year-old male patient, four and a half weeks status post ankle arthrodesis in the city uh, in Chicago who um, was unable to get a hold of his surgeon 
Uh, for follow-up, he was concerned about possible surgical site infection. He had a temperature, so he came to our emergency room. Uh, he was admitted, and, and that's how I inherited him. He's, his past medical history is hyperlipidemia, hypertension, obesity, and he is a smoker. Active smoker, still smoking. Smoked before the fusion was done. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, his treatment was he was called in oral antibiotics uh, after he'd called the office, uh, his surgeon's office, uh, concerned with possible infection. So you can see on the left side, he's got uh, surgical dehiscence, uh, critical structures exposed, so tibialis anterior tendon. Uh, and actually, if you, you probe the wound, probe around, you're, you're, you're in there, there everything's, everything's in your face. So you can move the tendon over, and that anterior plate uh, was exposed. So that plate needs to come out. Um, so I took the anterior plate out, uh, I cultured him, I tried to get lucky. I felt we were with, within a six-week window. We initiated intravenous antibiotics and right away. Um, sometimes, you know, if you have a stable construct, you can leave the hardware in and treat him and, and hope, hope for the, 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 that it will heal. And so I felt the, the two cannulated screws uh, were well positioned. It was solid. Take the plate out, clean it up, um, and, and, and move forward. Um, things not to look over at this point. But prior to going to surgery, he did have a vascular assessment, so that was really important. We had talked about uh, smoking cessation, ad nauseum. Um, we talked about non-weight bearing and all the things that this could look like moving forward and the length of time that this would take to heal as he would require um, multiple surgical procedures, not only to heal the wound, but also potential revision arthrodesis or, or limb loss. So week two after um, uh, the IND uh, with hardware removal and cultures. Uh, we, we again had wound vac going after that hardware was removed. You can see adjacent to the tendon, he has nice uh, granular tissue, so blood flow looked to be okay. Um, in, in week four um, is where I started to consider our options. What, what, what's best at this point? You know, you're concerned about a possible septic nonunion, um, trying to get lucky, but know that 40% of the time it can go on to a to an aseptic non-union, um, and then certainly getting, getting the wound healed. Knowing he was on a pick line, um, again, being judicious about resources and time, um, I felt comfortable trying to get him closed in the outpatient center with advanced therapy. So I used, at about week four or five, I initiated the use of a, a dehydrated placental allograft with indication for coverage of critical structures. And so you can see week six, um, maybe a little bit of change. Um, Week seven, the characteristics of that wound look much improved. Um, and again, these were weekly applications. Um, wound vac up into week eight, we continued with the, the dehydrated placental allograft, but discontinued the wound vac. And um, at week 10, we're, we're really making progress. And I like to tell my patients, you know, we're, we're at the top of the hill and we're about to head down. Um, I don't know how long it's gonna take to get down, but a lot of the heavy lifting has been done. So I felt pretty comfortable at week 10 that we were gonna get this closed. And now my mind's starting to shift about what am I gonna do with this ankle arthrodesis? So week 11, week 12, uh, again, qualities of the wound look great. Uh, tibialis anterior is covered. And by week 14, um, we're virtually closed. So now we're somewhere in the range of three and a half months, four months, uh, since his anterior plate was removed. Generally, I wait six months, so six months of treatment. He was scheduled at that time for, um, for hardware removal, bone biopsy. Uh, as you can see, it's not healed. And so at this point, I'm thinking, is this an aseptic non-union, septic non-union? Um, you know, what are we gonna do? I've also now got an anterior uh, access site that's gone because he had a wound there. So you're not going back in there. Um, so what I did, uh, we, we cultured him at, the, at that time. Hardware came out. Uh, there was no infection, so his cultures were negative. We had his anterior ankle healed. Um, and we took him back to the operating room uh, through a, a lateral takedown. So we removed his fibula, uh, reprepped, and, and plated uh, his ankle. This is him uh, two and a half weeks post-op. And this is him at discharge. So a little bit of combination of, of, of products. I think the, 
the, the one thing that I would stress, and to Dr. Kirzner's point, is that for, for many decades we focused a lot on um, efficacy and, and certain companies have high level data that supports really good efficacy of products. And then you start to talk about effectiveness um, or relative effectiveness. And that's, that's kind of where you mirror the science and then, and then the real world and, and, and how to use some of these products. And the application of some of these products in my practice are not necessarily how they were intended to be used. But again, through, um, I guess, cl clinical use, we've demonstrated really, really good effectiveness um, of these products in, in trying to heal really, really challenging wounds. So uh, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we have time for some questions if you'd like. I think I see a, a microphone at least up front here. Uh, any questions? Uh, yeah, please. Thank you for the great. Thank you for the great presentation. I have a question for Dr. Clemency on the case one. Uh, what was the size of the graft you used in the outpatient setting? Was it reimbursable uh, size of the graft? So case one, sorry, I'm trying to remember. That's the transmit. Transmit special. Oh, yeah. yes. Um, good question. So I work in an HOD. So the size of the graphs that I can use are, there's, there's really only a few sizes. It was the largest to, to be approved as a four by four. So you have to be judicious about how you're able to use it. The, the, the graph size is smaller than the wound. And so I, I will cut it up or if it's fenestrated, you can expand it and, and get pretty good coverage. But um, I'm limited in what I can use because of where I work. And, and, that just, and we'll talk a little bit more about that at lunch. But, Hospital outpatient department versus private practice the, um, applications are what you can get approved is different. So four by four is the answer. Yeah. Great. Other questions? Dr. Clemency, reference to your case with the lady with the ongoing bleeding in the leg and the hematoma, what criteria would you recommend to try to convince the surgeons to at least partially decompress a deep tissue hematoma so that you don't wind up with that big cavitary wound? Uh, that stays in the wound clinic forever. Yeah, it's. It, are you talking about the garden injury, or yes, the after, after lip, or after stabilization and before the compaction or during the compaction? Yeah, so how do we prevent hematoma? How do you? What criteria do you use to when to go and at least partially decompress that? Because surgeons don't want to open the hematoma thinking that you're. Yeah, that's a great question. So that case specifically, it was so fresh. You no, know, 48 hours. We had no mature hematoma. We just had active bleeding, but. To your point, and we see it every day, people on blood thinners, elderly people, really skin th thin skin, uh, they go in, they, they do this quick closure in the operating room, and, or in the, in the emergency room, and they get this massive mature hematoma with dead space. Um, sometimes I'm lucky and I'll see them early enough where I can try and, and, and decompress the hematoma. They're tough cases. Um, I tell all my patients, you may end up ultimately getting this skin resected. It may not work um, because of, of just the, the act of bleeding and how quickly it takes for that, that dead space to, to occur and to get healed. But I, I think early decompression gives you the best chance, but I don't think it's a guarantee. Um, and, and how do you convince other services <laughs> to do it? I don't know. I guess I'm lucky that I can do it because I, 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 I think you have to just talk to them about, you know, potential outcomes. Um, and, and I think we know that decompressing, whether it's a hematoma or an infection, you know, never let the sun set on pus. You, it, it should be done and done relatively quickly. So it gives you your best chance. Great. Other questions? Uh, so one thing I did want to point out is that uh, you can see from Dr. Clemency's cases that uh, none of these would have been able to be entered in a randomized control trial. <laughs> These are real world um, experiences. And, um, and, and probably each one of us has uh, uh, our, our own set of real world experiences that, uh, that probably have patients that wouldn't necessarily, for whatever reason, 
for age or for vascular disease or renal failure not been allowed to be in a randomized controlled trial. And that's why it's really the combination of this data that helps inform, uh, you know, what products may be the best for which patients at which time. I think we have a question up here. Uh, in regards to application of the bilayered skin equivalent, is there any kind of uh, frequency or suggestions as far as, you know, the best way to optimize wound healing by using that product in a stage procedure? So, uh, so, so I'll, I'll let uh, Dr. Clemency talk about the product he used and then I'll talk about uh, other products. Yeah, so with, with that product specifically in those case examples, it's only indicated for the surgical setting. With the use of that product, um, I think a lot of it has to do with more depth than size in, in terms of whether you do a second application. Typically what I do is it will go on and then there's a, I put a wound back on. Um, so I'm trying to use this product as a scaffolder to support the body's ability to heal and I will let it go for three to six weeks. Um, and then it comes off because it, at a certain point it's not doing anything anymore. And if I feel like we, we've got more, um, more depth and more can be done, then um, I'll either go back or we'll just put the wound back on, I may initiate a different product in the outpatient side. Um, so it, it, it depends. But generally I'm comfortable leaving it there for three to six weeks. Yeah. Yeah, the nomenclature is very confusing because even by this question, I wasn't sure what you were referring to. Yeah, so, oh, so the, yeah. The, the... Different, different yeah, answer. Yeah, so, so as answer. you may know, the, the commercial product, Aplograph, if you go through the literature, it's been called human skin equivalent, bilayered cellular construct, uh, graft skin, and probably two or three other names. And it's, 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 so it's very confusing sometimes <laughs> to say, okay, well, you know, what, what, uh, what, which product is this referring to without, you know, really knowing. But for that product, um, uh, it's interesting because uh, it was studied in randomized controlled trials uh, for venous leg ulcers. Patients uh, received uh, five applications over a three-week period. And for diabetic foot ulcers, they received five applications over a four-week period. But then, subsequently, as it was uh, marketed, there were other studies that were done where it was applied in a less frequent basis. Uh, pr and, and in clinical practice now, kind of the standard is to apply it and then ass assess how the wound is responding uh, about, about two or three weeks after uh, application and then reapply it about a week, uh, somewhere between week two and four, depending on the, when you're going to see the patient. Um, generally, by the third application, you'll see, the, you should see the wound respond. And if you do see the wound respond after three applications, then you go on to complete the five application course. If you don't see the wound respond after three applications, it suggests that maybe that's not the, the right product for that, uh, for that wound at that time. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Well, I think because of time, uh, we have to get to the opening session. I want to thank Dr. Clemency for his great presentation. I want to thank all of you for being here. Thank you very much. <laughs>